share my screen and we'll we'll get this going. Thanks, Dan. Sure. Okay, can everybody see this screen? I assume so. Yes, it looks great. Okay, um, so once again, my name is Daniel Chichinsky. I'm a graduate student in the Land Resources and Environmental Sciences Department. My project is on the integration of thistle rust into organic management of Canada thistle. So Canada thistle, uh, the Latin name is Circe marvens, is a perennial invasive weed that is found throughout temperate climates of the world. Um, it is particularly destructive and difficult to manage in organic cropping systems. Um, it can lead to crop yield losses and it can also lead to a reduction in diversity in natural and in native systems. Um, we know that the best way to manage Canada thistle is through integrated weed management approaches. Um, so I'm looking into the potential for the use of Puccinia punctiformis, we call it thistle rust, um, as a biological control for Canada thistle. Now thistle rust is a fungal pathogen and it exists in the rhizome and in the above ground vegetation of Canada thistle. Um, it also can drop its spores uh, at the soil surface where it can live in Canada thistle leaf debris um, until it comes in contact with a new host. Specifically, my, one of my research questions is focusing on how thistle rust responds to organic uh, tillage. Um, so at the Fort Ellis Research Farm, we've set up an experiment where we're looking into two treatments. We have a reduced till mowing treatment and a standard till disc cultivation treatment. And basically here we have varying degrees of Canada thistle and varying degrees of the thistle rust pathogen existing in these fields. Um, and these two maps are showing the differences between the fields between 2020 and 2021 in response to our um, tillage treatments. The colors are basically just showing the change in rates of the thistle rust pathogen in each field. Um, and uh, basically what we've seen is over the last two years, there's been an expansion of or the area of the Canada thistle patches has expanded. However, the density of Canada thistle has declined and the abundance of our thistle rust pathogen has increased. This first graphic here is showing the differences in Canada thistle stem density between 2020 and 2021. What we had was on average, Canada thistle was reduced by 53% in the disc treatment and by 55% in the mowing treatment. If we look over to the information here on 2021, we see that we have a higher level of symptomatic it symptomatically infected Canada thistle stems when there's a higher density of Canada thistle overall. Um, and really what this is kind of showing us is that this pathogen is most successful when it exists where there are high populations of Canada thistle because there's an abundance of hosts and there's a higher opportunity for it to transmit spores um, to new hosts and uh, go through its reproduction process. Additionally, what we're seeing is that thistle rust has increased by 61% in the disc treatment and by 51% in the mowing treatment between 2020 and 2021. There isn't really a big difference between the two treatments um, that we can, we can piece out this year. Um, however, we're seeing that our management, our management plan is um, increasing the abundance of this beneficial pathogen. Um, so we can assume that there will be more spores on the soil surface and more opportunity for this pathogen to infect new Canada thistle hosts, and hopefully over time begin to reduce the Canada thistle density. Um, and as a quick disclaimer, I think it's important to note that there has been, there have been drought conditions at the Fort Ellis Research Farm over the last couple of years. So that is uh, another factor that plays into um, the reduction in Canada thistle that we're seeing. Okay, so we're also looking into the impacts of competition at the MSU greenhouse here in Bozeman. What we've done is we have set up two treatments. We have a control where we grow Canada thistle without the pathogen. And then we have an inoculated treatment where we inoculate Canada thistle rosettes with the thistle rust pathogen. And what we're doing is trying to see how competition impacts Canada thistle 
um, when it is infected versus not infected with the pathogen. Um, so what we're doing is we have a four phase cropping rotation. Uh, phase, phase one is a simulated fallow where we let Canada thistle um, establish its rhizome, uh, followed by phase two where we plant hard red spring wheat, followed by phase three, which is a forage pea, and finally phase four, which is safflower. Um, after each of these phases, when we, when we harvest, we allow the Canada thistle to regrow because it's a perennial weed. Um, we re-inoculate and then we plant the next crop. Uh, this trial is going, or these phases, or sorry, this rotational experiment is um, going, will be done over three separate trials. And what we're looking at are the impacts of competition. So we're using an index called the relative competition index where we're concerned with the percent weight reduction between our control and our inoculated. So we assume that Canada thistle in control in a control setting where it's not infected is going to be more competitive than Canada thistle, which is infected and also fighting for resources in a competitive system. Um, so we assume that there will be a higher weight reduction for our inoculated treatment. Now, if we focus here on the first two, which is spring wheat and forage pea, we actually see that our control um, had a higher weight reduction, but by the time we get to our final phase, which is safflower, we see a big switch. Um, we have a 30% weight reduction in our inoculated treatment compared to a 13% weight reduction in our control treatment. And then moving on to our second trial, we're, we're two thirds of the way through this trial. Um, we still have one more phase that we're waiting on. Um, but here we see uh, quite a bit of a difference. Instead, we have a 32% reduction in our control and a 61% reduction of Canada thistle biomass in our inoculated treatment when it is in direct competition with spring wheat. And then for the forage peas phase, we had 45% loss um, in our control and 76% loss in our inoculated treatment. Um, so this is giving us a bit of a, an indication that there's a chance, there's a pretty good chance that the addition of a fungal disease um, in our integrated weed management plans for Canada thistle will help reduce the competitive ability of uh, the Canada thistle perennial weed. And that is sort of the quick summary of my work here at MSU. Um, I'd like to open it up to any questions. Oli, do you wanna ask your question? Sure. I was just wondering how you get a 50 plus percent reduction from year to year in your in your trials at Fort Ellis. How how did that come around? That's a very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, so in addition to the tillage treatments and the biocontrol, um, we we've been planting. Um, so our first year we planted a forage barley crop, a highly competitive forage barley crop. And then the second year we planted a, a triticale and pea mixture. Um, so we are including competition in, this, in these trials. Um, so I think the compounding effects of our biocontrol, our tillage and our cropping system is helping reduce the thistle. Um, and then on top of that, we've, we've had a pretty big reduction in water over the last three years. So there is the drought effect. Um, and that's something that we have kind of been working on piecing or kind of pulling apart and understanding what, what's really causing the impact. Um, but it's a combination of those things. The follow up question very fast. Have, have you found a way to inoculate thistles in the fall in a very efficient way yet? Not yet. Um, it's still pretty, pretty a manual process. Um, I know that there are people in the region working through it. Um, just unfortunately, we haven't really had the time to develop any sort of recipes that are efficient. Thank you. Okay, shall we keep moving on? Um, yeah. Kara, are you ready? Uh, yes. Apologies, everyone. I think, um, oops, sorry. Well, I think um, maybe the, the tickets overlap. So some of us were on the wrong one for a little bit. So apologies there. Um, but yeah, uh, I will share my screen and get that going.
One sec, sorry. All right, can you guys see a slideshow? Awesome, all right, I'll move you guys out of the way. So um, I missed some of it, unfortunately, but I'm sure Dan introed um, a little bit about um, Canada thistle and um, perennial weeds um, in agro ecosystems here in Montana. Um, so my study sort of looks at both cultural and mechanical controls um, for both field bindweed uh, and uh, creeping thistle. So again, Dan might have gone over this, um, but both these weeds um, as perennials are very difficult to control in um, organic systems in Montana and throughout the world. Um, and that's often due to their dense root stock and their ability to spread uh, via these rhizomes, which are um, these lateral roots, which can produce new flowering parts known as propagules. So oftentimes the root system of these plants um, have incredible carbohydrate stores, which is energy for the plant. So even when it undergoes a disturbance such as tillage, um, as you can see in this photo, oftentimes there is enough uh, energy stored in that root system to allow um, for uh, a new flowering plant to uh, re-sprout, as you can see here. This is a photo I took in the field um, this past summer. Tiny little piece of creeping thistle root fragment um, had just enough energy to allow a new flowering part. Um, so I had uh, two different studies, one which is completed, uh, one which is still ongoing. Uh, this one looked at different uh, treatments for field bindweed, and this took place out at the Western Agricultural Research Center um, out in Corvallis. Uh, there are 10 different treatments organized on this spectrum from least to most soil disturbance. Um, and basically what that means is that at one end, you have a very intensive tillage regime um, that's in fallow. And at this other end, you have um, your perennial crop, so alfalfa in this case, one which received uh, glyphosate treatment at the beginning of the study um, and the other which was kept organic. So just kind of breezing through to results here, we're looking at field bindweed densities um, by our different cropping system treatment. Um, here at the top with the most amount of bindweed, you saw that annual crop, cover crops, um, and grazing based treatments saw these really sharp increases in bindweed abundance over time. And at this lower end, um, of densities, both our intensive tillage treatments and our alfalfa treatments kept bindweed abundance very low uh, throughout the course of the study. And so using those values, again, we have our treatments on this um, soil disturbance spectrum. You can calculate growth rate. Um, so we did that for the um, entirety of the study from 2017 to 2020. So negative numbers, as you might assume, indicate decrease in population of bindweed positive numbers indicate um, an increasing population. So right away, you could see um, our two intensive tillage fallows had um, pretty sharply decreasing bindweed populations. Um, however, we also saw that uh, both our alfalfa treatments um, had the same sort of decreasing populations of bindweed with most of our intermediate treatments um, having increasing or stable rates um, of bindweed growth. So in our second study, which is ongoing, it's taking place at the Central Ag Research Center in Moccasin and uh, here in Bozeman at the Fort Ellis Research Farm, um, we have sort of a same um, set of treatments organized on a gradient instead of um, one using tillage, one using competition or crop competition. So at the top, for example, we have what you'd consider your most competitive uh, rotation, which is alfalfa with a barley nurse crop. And at the least competitive end, you have wheat followed by two years of tilled fallow. And so just looking at some preliminary results, uh, this is the so biomass by crop um, at the Central Ag Research Center. We saw an increase in thistle from year one to year two, likely due to time um, allowing for establishment and then a decrease, um, again, likely due to that um, pretty intense drought we had in the spring and summer. However, if you look at this a biomass by crop specifically, you can see much like in the field bindweed study, uh, perennial alfalfa is keeping biomass relatively low, um, especially when compared to cover crops. 
um, or some uh, leguminous species like pea. And again, at Fort Ellis um, Research Farm, we only have two years of data, but again, you see that decrease um, in overall biomass due to drought. Um, but you can see that alfalfa and uh, competitive grains have kept this biomass um, pretty low, uh, especially when you compare that to a less competitive uh, pea crop. Um, so with that, uh, pretty brief, but I would like to open it up for any questions. Um, and if you have time um, and have further questions, there's a lot I skipped over obviously in this presentation. Um, but yeah, any questions, be happy to take them. And um, if not, also okay. And I can introduce our next speaker. I'll stop sharing my screen. Okay, um, so our next speaker, I think Dan may have given a heads up, um, should be uh, a Paul Hegedus, um, and followed by Paul, we'll have Elizabeth Riva. Um, so Paul, if you wanna share your screen. Yeah. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Paul Hegedus, and today, um, well, just a background. Oh, geez, that's just going with the recording. Okay. Um, anyway, my name is Paul Hegedus, and uh, I work with Bruce Maxwell at Montana State University. I'm one of his PhD students. Um, and my work is primarily in uh, conventional systems, uh, looking at variable nitrogen fertilizer rates. So I'm not really going to be presenting on results because this is an organic conference. Um, but what I am going to do is talk about the digital data that we use. Um, for making management decisions and sort of how we put that together and harness that um, for, to supplement farmer knowledge. Um, and sorry, I'm not gonna go into the presentation view because it I have my recording below it and it, that, uh, it's gonna, I'll, I'd rather just talk. Um, so um, as you all might know, uh, in the past few years, the average farm size has been increasing uh, while the number of farms has been decreasing. So this is indicating that farmers have a lot more land that they're managing. Um, and so that means that, you know, as they have more land to manage, they're busier, they have less time to spend sort of out in their fields. Um, and so they're it's sort of a less intimate relationship with their land. Um, but on the other hand, we've got a tremendous amount of data being gathered um, on farms and about farms. And so the amount of data generated by the average farm is increasing exponentially. Um, and so this talk is sort of about what digital data is available um, about farms and on farms um, and sort of how we put that together into a format that's usable for farmers. Um, and so this goes to the next slide. Um, I've got a little animation here. Um, so excuse the talking over it from the recording, but I'm gonna go into the presentation view so it slides through. But one of the ways that we can use, uh, use data is by, sorry, I'm gonna cut out of that. Um, but as you saw where it's flipping through, one of the ways that we can use digital data, um, especially in regards to vegetation indices like NDVI is we can gather it from the past and map it out for a area of interest. So like for this farm, and you can use that to sort of supplement farmer knowledge of what the management was in the past. Um, so at the beginning of that simulation, you could see that there was strip farming. Um, and then sort of as it progresses through, you can see the transition to crop fallow. And so that's sort of a way to supplement farmer knowledge. If you buy land and you don't exactly know everything that happened on it before you bought it, um, you can look at vegetation index data and sort of see what the past management was. Um, and so that's sort of one way that we can use digital data. Um, but what I'm gonna focus on today is sort of how we use digital data in this on-farm precision experiments framework. Um, and so basically the gist of this is that we set up experiments for nitrogen fertilizer or seeding rates, um, or really any input that you want to be experimenting with. Um, and then you can collect your data such as yield and protein um, put it together, analyze it, and then sort of come up with these optimum maps um, for recommendations that 
farmers should be doing to optimize their net returns or any other sort of response variable you want to uh, manage on. And so I'm going to talk about this data collection and data aggregation. Um, and then Sasha Lowen will talk a little bit later about sort of how we analyze that data and, and make these uh, recommendations for farmers. Um, so as most of you know, we can gather a bunch of data from farms directly. Um, so a lot of the equipment nowadays has yield monitors. Um, you can also buy protein monitors um, that can measure you know, grain protein content, but they can also measure things like starches or oil content of crops um, all across the field spatially. Um, and then we also have data from sprayers and seeders that we can get experimental data from. Um, Varus machines are becoming a little bit more common to get um, sort of spatial maps of pH or EC. Uh, drones are also another way that we can gather data from fields. Um, and then of course, weather stations. Um, so even on the farm, there's a bunch of data collection going on, uh, whether the farmer is using it or not. Uh, most modern machines are collecting data and we can use that to make decisions. Um, additionally, uh, there's a ton of satellites orbiting the earth and a lot of those are taking ground-based or measurements remotely sensed um, that we can use to make decisions. Um, and so, like I was showing earlier, we have vegetation index, index data um, that measures things like the greenness of the crop. Um, you can also measure the water content of crops. Um, and additionally, these satellites are gathering things like topographic variables, like elevation, slope, um, as well as things related to the climate, like precipitation and growing degree days. Um, and then combining the remote sensing data with ground-based measurements, um, we're getting a bunch of data about soils. Um, and so uh, labs like NASA and stuff are generating these data sets on soil moisture, texture, bulk density um, across the globe at pretty good spatial, spatial scales. Um, and so these are the sorts of data that we can gather on farms and about farms, um, not directly, but from satellites. And so we can gather that and put it together into our decision-making framework. Um, and so collecting data is actually getting a lot easier. So on-farm data, um, it's gathered by the machine. And with a lot of these new softwares, you can just upload it directly to the cloud, either manually, um, or in some cases like my John Deere, you can get a subscription. And then once the tractor or the sprayer goes back into the barn, um, it connects to Wi-Fi and then just sends that data directly to the cloud. Um, and so we can, you know, get access to that from a farmer and just download it directly. Um, or we can just go out to the farmer, plug in a USB stick and get that data um, directly. Um, same goes for sort of the grain protein content. Um, but this remote sensing data is a little bit more inaccessible. So there's various repositories that hold this data. Um, but a lot of them require sort of coding experience to extract the data from the repository and download it um, and put it into a format that we can actually start messing with. Um, and so that is sort of a opportunity, I guess, for industry to um, sort of step in and make this data more accessible for farmers. Um, there's also ways that you can just go directly to uh, the satellite provider's website and do point and click methods of downloading that data. Um, but that sort of takes a lot of time that farmers definitely don't have. So, uh, sorry, I've got the recording behind it. So I'm not gonna, not gonna jump into it, but essentially this data aggregation process um, involves gathering your data from the farm. So for example, you can get your yield points um, and then you have your remote sensing rasters that can be sort of stacked up um, above it, um, just sort of a way to visualize it. And then when we're putting all the data together, basically you go up from one point and skewer all the data that's sitting above it. And so it's sort of like a kebab where the onions and the meat and the peppers are all your different uh, data sources. And then you can line your kebabs up on a plate. And so each of these would represent each kebab is a different point in the field. And so you can sort of visualize that as a table. And so for each row, you have 
an observation of yield, but then you also have your um, all your remote sensing information um, co-located at that point. And so then we get a table um, and we can use this to run our analyses um, and run simulations of different management scenarios and provide those to the farmer um, and give them management recommendations that ultimately they can decide from um, on what they wanna do and how they wanna use that data. Um, and so, yeah, again, Sasha Lowen's gonna be talking about that more. Um, and so this is just sort of an overview of, you know, what data we have available and sort of how we put it together. Um, and so, yeah, there's a bunch of data available on farms and about farms. Um, it needs to be accessible to farmers. On-farm data typically is, but again, uh, data from remote sensing sources is sort of uh, hidden behind this uh, technological skill of being able to extract it. So that's definitely an avenue where we need to make it more accessible to farmers so that they can just download it directly and start using it themselves. Um, and yeah, digital data, it, it shouldn't replace farmer knowledge. I know that's sort of where it seems like precision ag is going, but it really just needs to supplement farmer knowledge because there's no replacement for what a farmer actually sees out in the field themselves. Um, so yeah, that's just sort of a gist of digital data and how we can harness that. So yeah, if there's any questions. Yeah, I had some in the chat. Uh, Jeff Shazinski with NKD. Ah, is yeah. This, is this data kind of totally free? And of course it seems you have to have skill and free and is the privacy ultimately that gets mixed in with farmer's data assured of privacy? Do we have the same issues as we do with so much of this? Yeah, so, you know, farmer data that they collect on their on their farms, like from their combine or whatever, um, you know, that that is the farmer's data. So uh, that isn't accessible to anyone. But this remote sensing data is completely open source. It's free, it's open, um, and anybody can download it. And so the same sort of privacy standards that are there with data collected by equipment on a farm don't really apply to data collected from a satellite. And so when I'm downloading data from Google Earth Engine, I can just sort of draw a boundary out anywhere on Earth and say, hey, I want this data from this area and it'll just give it to me. So yeah, there's no real uh, privacy restrictions in that sense. Um, Obviously that data is a little bit more coarse resolution and it's not um, sort of as personal as yield data might be, um, but yeah, it's anybody can grab it and anybody can use it. Um, Paul, this is Becky. I have a question. Yeah. Um, the other day when you and Bruce were talking about this and Sasha, um, somehow I got booted out. So all I could get was audio and couldn't participate in the Bummer. chat. So my question is sort of partly related to that. But um, at one point, Bruce was talking about the possibility of creating some kind of a co-op or some entity to have data rather than yielding all the potential profits from such a system to the university or some other institution, which seems like a, a good question to raise. Um, and so I guess, you know, just now you were talking about how the farmer owns all of his or her data, but what's the discussion underway about finding a means for collecting these data for research purposes where a farmer could maintain anonymity, but still have the fields be part of a broader research environment? Do you, do you see what I'm asking? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um... And so, yeah, I think that definitely ties into sort of this co-op idea where, um, you know, farmers, you know, would get access for free. And then, you know, if consultants or academics want to use it, maybe they would pay a little bit. Um, and, you know, the, far the data is the farmers. I mean, that's definitely going to be a priority. But in terms of anonymizing it, uh, we could definitely do that. And then before we actually share it with, far or with researchers or anybody else who wants to use it, um, just gaining explicit permission from the farmer of, hey, can so-and-so use your data and look at it and sort of the degree that they want to anonymize it, whether we 
you know, just block out their names, or if we adjust the um, sort of locations on it, you know, we can sort of anonymize it that way by changing the point locations and put it somewhere like random, like in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And then, you know, the distance between the points would stay the same, but whoever's using that data wouldn't know exactly where it came from. Um, that would be one way to do that. But yeah, I know privacy is a big issue, but also accessibility and access to this data is also super important for, for researchers and academics to look at it and start using it. Yeah, I mean, my understanding from the conventional precision ag world, um, the horse is already out of the barn and <laughs> a lot of custom applicators own data that belong, I mean, the, it's on the farmer's fields, but the custom applicators who are connected to the vendors are the ones in control of the data. And so, you know, the organic community has an opportunity to operate in a different way. Um, I guess really, I guess I'm, I'm trying to understand the lay of the land, but also saying to you and Bruce and Sasha and everybody, I would like MOA to continue this conversation, whether it's through MOA as trade association, Jeff has raised the issue from NCAT, um, MOA now has a nonprofit arm called Organic Montana. Um, we maybe should do some brainstorming and explore any or all of these institutions as some kind of a framework to, so, so farmers can have some institutional framework to hang their hat on without actually giving up their data. I don't know, I'm, uh, this is more questions than answers, but um, let's try to follow up because I think this is probably more important than we wanna think it is. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I guess sort of one amendment that I'll make is based off of discussions we had earlier today actually with a consultant, um, apparently when data goes to my John Deere, for example, um, that data that is directly off the combine is the farmers, but apparently sort of in the fine print of these softwares and um, sort of cloud applications is that once that farmer makes a map on that application, then it becomes the company's data as well. Um, and so that's sort of a issue regarding privacy that is definitely needs to be addressed. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not even, I mean, uh, farmer privacy is important, but but my concern in the longer run is really about um, corporate control of both the tools and the food supply and regulatory decision-making about what's acceptable to society or not. Um, so it's more than just about, you know, Farmer John wanting to be, keep his cards close to his chest. Yeah, that, uh... That I agree with that. That we need we need to have this data accessible and open source, and it can't just be sort of controlled by the corporations. And and I think that's sort of a, the impetus that our group is working to, or one of the impetuses for our group and why we're trying to make something that's open source and available is that you know we don't want you know just industry to be controlling these things so that they have all the say and input into how policy goes. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate all you guys raising these questions now, um, rather early in the game compared to what has happened elsewhere. And, and I feel like, you know, if, if you ever need any assistance in communicating these issues with administrative powers that be at MSU, um, please feel free to reach out because some of us have some experience with the conventional precision ag world. And so this isn't just kind of a hypothetical imagine a threat kind of a discussion. Yeah, yeah, I think we uh, definitely will. because That's definitely not my forte, but yeah, it's good to have people like you. Thanks for, thanks for doing it. Hey, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Becky. Uh, if there are any more questions for Paul, please feel free to bring them up in the chat. Um, I think we'll move forward with Elizabeth um, and Hannah Duff, you are on deck. All right, I'll just share my screen then. Find my find the PowerPoint. There we are. Uh, you guys can all see that. Looks good. All right. So I'm Elizabeth Riva. Uh, I'm in the Land Resources and Environmental Science Department at MSU, and today I'm going to be presenting on biodigesters. So 
we're still early on in our research, so there isn't a whole lot of hard data I can show you. So we're going to start with a brief introduction to biodigesters and then go into some food waste collection data that we got this last summer. So first, one of the reasons biodigesters are so applicable to organic farming is the challenge of nutrient management you can face in, in organic farming. So I would like to you know, propose that biodigesters, especially biofertilizers that come from biodigesters could be another practice to uh, go with the use of animal manure, green manure, compost to help with restoring nutrients and maintaining soil health. So a biodigester is a sort of insulation that uses anaerobic digestion or uh, you know contains microbes that thrive in an oxygenless environment to produce products such as biofertilizer and biogas, which I'll be getting into a little later. Uh, they come in a variety of designs. You can have things scaled for uh, farms to municipalities all the way down to household biodigesters, which is what uh, we are researching, but uh, organic farmers will likely be more interested in the farm scale biodigesters. Uh, they're already pretty commonly used outside the US in Latin American countries, South American countries, Asian countries, uh, particularly again by farmers and municipalities as a sort of organic waste management practice. So uh, biodigesters, have, uh, so feedstock is what you put into a biodigester, and this includes farm waste, the sort of food for the microbes, food waste, lawn clippings, not exactly uh, for farmers, more likely uh, chaff and such, uh, animal manure. This again is the food for the microbes, what they're going to be you know, consuming to produce your uh, biofertilizer and biogas. You'll also have your inoculant, some kind of substance rich with the helpful microbes that you're going to be using to introduce that microbial environment into your biodigester. So this can be manure, fresh unpasteurized milk, or even effluent from a biodigester that is already operational. Uh, should only need to be added once right at the very beginning. And then you also have water, which helps create that anaerobic environment and is sort of the medium in which all of this takes place. So again, there are two main outputs for uh, biodigesters. Biogas is a mix of carbon dioxide and methane released by microbes. Generally, the higher the methane content, the better the fuel. Uh, you can use this for heating, cooking, energy, uh, sale, and it's generally used as needed and not stored. That's, you know, and most installations will have that as the, as the setup. Uh, and then you have biofertilizers, what, which is going to be of main interest to our research uh, and, again, is most applicable for that question of nutrient management. Biofertilizers is a mixture containing microbes and nutrients that has been recycled from the feedstock. Uh, it can serve as an alternative to synthetic fertilizers. Uh, this can be applied to compost, uh, folially to, to plant leaves, or to soil. This can improve soil health, again, by restoring nutrients, but also by sort of invigorating that microbial environment. Uh, and once again, excess biofertilizers can be sold. So uh, this is not exactly a biodigester you're probably going to see in a farm, but it's useful for sort of showing the different parts of a biodigester that you're going to see. So you have your inlet, where things go in, output, where your biofertilizer is going to come out. Uh, the main holding tank for the uh, where everything's going to be happening for the biodigester, uh, expansion chambers if necessary, uh, and then the pipe where the biogas is going to be living. You'll notice that the main holding tank contains both the effluent and also the biogas, so it's important to keep that in mind for, for designing a biodigester. So once again, what makes biodigesters applicable to organic farming? Once again, that Improvement of nutrient management help keep your soil healthy and fertile by again uh, re, uh, keeping nutrient levels at a good place and also 
uh, keeping that microbial environment healthy and complete. Uh, they also are useful for, again, reducing the waste you have on a farm and also creating useful outputs, which is increases a farm sustainability, both in an environmental sense, you're avoiding using, you know, non-organic fertilizers, uh, but you're also doing it in a way that helps your economic sustainability by turning things that would have just been thrown away into inputs that you can go back into your farm to improve production. Uh, and then, of course, excess outputs can be sold uh, for another revenue stream, which could be helpful for you know, farmers. So there are some limitations to consider with biodigesters. Uh, they need about a minimum temperature of 50 degrees to really work. So their use could be limited in colder climates. Obviously, you're not gonna be using them during the winter. Uh, you have to make sure they're completely sealed. Uh, you can't let any oxygen into the installation because of that anaerobic digestion process that it relies on. And then, you know, keep in mind organic certification requirements can limit options for your feedstock if you're planning on using biofloc fertilizer on your own crops. So if you have like a personal vegetable garden that you're using conventional fertilizer on, uh, you're not going to be able to use clippings from that uh, to use in your biofertilizer for your organic farm. So now I'm going to move on to quickly go over the household biodigester project. Our goal is to evaluate how well households can utilize biodigesters, uh, particularly in that production of biofertilizer. So we have a few steps in this process. We, we selected participating households, collect food waste from these households, distribute biodigesters to them, collect their fertilizer output, and then test the biofertilizer. This fall, we completed these first two steps. And again, I'll be showing you some data from that. Uh, and this spring, we hope to begin by distributing biodigesters and you know, hopefully get that production started so we can start collecting biofertilizer and testing it. So for household food waste, we have 12 participating households selected from a pool of volunteers uh, selected for as representative of Bozeman as we can get it. Uh, and we collect, we, we distributed five gallon buckets to these households to put uh, these food scraps into. Uh, we gave them a list of acceptable foods. Certain things were excluded, eggs, milk, uh, meats. Um, we collected these every week and then sorted them by hand. Here you can see undergraduate uh, Graceland Abel, hard at work. Uh, divvying up these different food wastes into buckets. We uh, weighed the fresh weight for each category. We divided them into, and then sort of collated them into uh, each different category for storage for later use. Uh, so from that collection, we got this data. Um, as you can see, the most common type of category, and these categories were determined by sort of nutrient content. Uh, were carbon-rich vegetables, tubers, and bulbs, followed by potassium-rich vegetables and fungi, nitrogen-rich vegetables, and uh, potassium-rich fruits, and coffee grounds. Uh, this gives us an idea of sort of the nutritional, sort of the nutrient composition of the food waste and any potential biofertilizers we may get out of them, uh, and gives us a better idea of what food waste in Bozeman looks like as well, which can be an interesting uh, interesting data to have. So the household biodigesters that we're going to be using for this, for this research project uh, include one here on the left designed by Dr. Roland Ebel and Dr. Jed Eberly, uh, and then on the right, a model designed by Home Biogas, uh, a company that provides household biodigesters. And since they have different amounts they can hold will be distributed in the households based on their food weight production, which is another sort of stat that we got this summer and fall. Uh, as part of our research, we we're also going to be testing uh, feedstock, um, different feedstock mixes. And to that end, this fall, we constructed our own biodigester. Uh, here you can see Dr. Roland Ebel and Graceland hard at work inoculating the biodigester. Um, <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, unfortunately, this fall, we weren't able to really 
get good data because it just got too cold too quickly, but we're going to be restarting these in the spring to hopefully, you know, get a better idea of what these different mixes produce and what might be uh, the best mix for a household to use of food waste. Uh, and we're very excited to, to get started in the spring constructing and distributing these biodigesters and collecting data. Any questions can be directed at me at, at my email uh, and I can answer or direct you to the appropriate sources. Uh, that's it. Um, I am more than happy to answer any questions. Uh, yeah, I think for um, time's sake, it looks like there's a lot of really good um, sort of in-depth questions in the chat box for you, Elizabeth. Um, and if anyone has any questions to sort of keep us on a good time frame, um, I suggest you you email Elizabeth um, and keep an eye on the chat box. There are a lot of good questions there. Um, so uh, I think we'll move into Hannah Duff's presentation now and on deck will be Het. Awesome, thank you. Um, if you can't tell, I have to be outside due to some weird issues at my house, but if you can see my breath, maybe it'll just wake you up. So that'll be exciting. So today I'm just talking about um, hosting biodiversity on farms and what sort of trade-offs can come with that. So I like to start just by thinking about a typical wheat field. We usually focus on the area that's in production, right? Um, but in my lab, which is agroecology, we also focus on these green spaces that are uncropped areas. And today I'm thinking about how does the biodiversity in these uncropped areas affect the wheat production in a field? So um, the name for these uncropped areas I'm sticking with for now on is ecological refugia. And some of these areas like in the picture on the left and in the middle are naturally occurring areas that are just too lie lowing for a farmer to crop. So they leave them out. And then the one on the far right, that's in Oli's field. And he actually planted this with a mix of different species because it was just really low producing. And so looking at these different systems, we're gonna just consider some of the trade-offs that come with them. So first I look at biodiversity on each farm, um, mostly just considering plant, insect, and then seed predation to look at small mammals. And then for trade-offs, I've been looking at yield, crop nutrition, like micronutrient content, and then seed predation. So one example of what I found this last summer, as you all know, it's a pretty bad year. So you can see in this first figure that the refuge didn't actually have significantly higher um, plant species richness than the field without a refuge. But the, in the year before, it was much higher in the refuge. And then if you look at the figure on the right, you can see that as we move from the refuge into the crop field, we have a decline in plant species richness. And so we would, we would guess that some of the ecosystem services of those, um, the higher plant diversity in the refuge might translate into the wheat field. Whereas on this farm, you can see this refuge is much smaller. And like I mentioned, it was more recently planted and the effects are much less dramatic. So the, the plant species richness doesn't decrease as much as you move into the crop field um, because the refuge has overall lower diversity. So over time, I'm interested to follow up on how this might change. So the next tier of diversity that I look at is then insects, which I collect through sweep netting and then I ID in the lab later. And you can see here that along the same transects as the plants, um, the insects actually, the species richness decreases significantly on both farms. And so that has interesting implications. Um, we wanna know if these are beneficial insects or are they pest insects? And so I've been breaking down this data a bit more and so, for example, on this farm, you can see that orange box is Hymenoptera insects, which are often pollinators, but can also be pest insects like wheat stem sawfly. Those were significantly higher in the refuge. And then in the yellow and blue boxes, those are typically pest predators and pollinators. And those were significantly higher in the refuge. So that might indicate a beneficial um, ecosystem service. Um, I'll skip some of these for time. Um, something else I'm working on is looking at a correlation matrix. So that if someone like Oli is trying to plant beneficial plant species to attract certain types of insects, they would have better info on that. So if you look at this far right column, 
everything associated with barnyard grass in a positive manner are um, beetles, flies, spiders, and caterpillars. And that might indicate planting barnyard grass is something you would want to do in your refuge if you want to attract those insects. So then for seed predation, I've been testing this by setting out seed traps with two types of crops and two types of weed seeds, and then coming back in two weeks and seeing what got eaten, which is very fun. And you can see from these two figures, these green boxes, I've indicated that there's a beneficial ecosystem service of weed seed predation that's higher in the refuge fields. And that's due to the fact I see a lot more small mice in these areas, and some of that could be from insects as well. And then we kind of have a mixed result with crop seed predation being actually higher in the refuge for farm one, um, but not for farm three. So that's not really something a farmer would want to see. So that could be some looking into. And then last for the economic analysis, we're looking at yield as a function of distance from the refuge to see if something about biodiversity and ecosystem services is having an impact on yield. And for this farm, we see that the yield actually um, declines about 1.2 bushels with every 20 meters from the refuge. And um, that's an interesting impact on crop quantity. And then for crop quality, um, I tested a few different micronutrient contents this year, but for example, for grain total polyphenols, those are associated with antioxidant content. So that would be a desirable characteristic in grain. And you can see here that there was much higher concentration of polyphenols in the control than in the refuge. And looking into the literature, in general, organic production has higher polyphenols because it's associated with stress in plants. And so this result might indicate that the plants in the control field are more stressed than in the ones with the refuge. So there's a lot more to be looked into concerning um, food quantity and quality as a result of these ecosystem services. But um, I'll just stop there for time and I'm happy to take any questions anyone has. I, I was starting to write in a question. Um, do you have a way of separating soil moisture from the other variables that decrease as you move away from the center of the refuge, since that might account for some of the change in yield? Becky's always onto it. As my next step, there's like a soil moisture map that Paul made for that field. And I think once I incorporate that into the model, it can kind of tease apart what might be causing that yield decrease. Yeah. That so makes yeah. Sense. <laughs> yeah. Emma, this is only yet. This is pretty cool stuff. Is there any way that you can draw kind of recommendations out if one want to make uh, pollinator strips in the field? How far they need to be from each other to get the full benefits? That's a great question. So, um, I definitely could. I think we should go over your data sometime because, like I mentioned, only has the smallest refuge of those three. And I think we'd be able to look at the difference in that versus the bigger refuges and see what would be best for the pollinator strips, um, as well as what species you wanna plant. Are you doing that this spring? Uh, this coming spring, that's the plan, yes. Okay, yeah, we should chat. That'd be great, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks, Hannah. Um, so up next we have Het followed by Sarah Rogers. Nice so can you see my screen now? Yes, yeah. looks good. All right. Uh, so uh, my name is Heit Samir Desai, and I'm a PhD student at Montana State University. Uh, and my major advisor is Dr. Laurie Shergill, and my co-advisor is uh, Fabian Manolet. Uh, so today we will be talking about harvest wheat seed control. Uh, which is a relatively novel approach uh, for weed management, uh, and in, um, particularly for Northern Great Plains. Uh, and this tactic can be, can be an addition in organic farmer's toolbox for weed management, uh, because uh, 
uh, it can control weeds non-chemically. Uh, so it can be used in uh, organic and conventional farming systems. So uh, the basic approach to control weeds, uh, the best and basic approach to control weeds is to uh, identify weak links in weeds life cycle. Uh, so that we can exploit them and uh, uh, we can we can control them efficiently. So in this figure, uh, are all dumbbells are choke point, uh, which indicates, uh, which basically indicates uh, the weak links in weed weed life cycle. Uh, so in this figure, we can see that there is a weak link between seed production and seed bank, uh, at which we can perform harvest weed seed control uh, by capturing and destroying. Uh, retain wheat seeds at the time of harvest. And that's the whole concept of, concept of harvest wheat seed control. Uh, so harvest wheat seed control works on capturing and destroying retained seed by wheat plants during small grain harvest. Uh, and in this way, it prevents the enrichment of soil seed bank uh, by capturing them and by capturing and destroying uh, uh, before seeds uh, uh, get into seed, uh, seed bank. So all harvest wheat seed tactics need combined modification. There are six different tactics of harvest wheat seed control. Uh, and I talked about each and every tactic uh, in, in the video uh, that was uh, uploaded on YouTube. Uh, so if anyone wants to find, uh, uh, wants to learn uh, about uh, different tactics of harvest wheat seed control, uh, they can probably go to YouTube and uh, uh, see the video. So uh, this tactic was this, this technology, that this whole technology was developed in Australia, uh, initially to tackle multiple herbicide resistance weed, but we can, we all know that herbicide resistance is not a problem in organic farming systems, but due to its uh, ability to control uh, weeds non-chemically, uh, it can be, it can be used in, in organic systems as well. And as I mentioned earlier, that it can be an addition uh, for organic farmers toolbox for integrated weed management systems. So these are uh, harvest weed seed control tactics. We have chaff cart, narrow windrow burning, bale rear, chaff lining, impact mill, and chaff tram lining. And all tactics, uh, uh, all tactics were discussed in the video that was uh, that that is that is on YouTube. So uh, what is our research objective? So our research objective was uh, to evaluate the seed shattering phenology of cheat grass and feral rye grass in winter wheat and uh, wild oat uh, in Seed, uh, seed grass and feral dry in winter wheat and wild oat in spring wheat. So uh, it is very important to uh, it is very important for harvest wheat seed control uh, to study seed shattering phenology because uh, uh, well, the higher seed retention at the time of crop maturity is very important. Otherwise, we won't be able to capture seeds at the time of harvest if uh, they are already shattered and if they are already in, in seed banks. So this is kind of what we have done uh, in, in last summer. So we had three species, cheatgrass, feral rye, and wild oat, and we spread, uh, spread them uh, before planting wheat. Uh, and then we selected uh, after, after they emerged, after, the, after plant matures and uh, start producing seeds, we selected uh, 15 plants randomly for each species uh, before uh, a week of uh, wheat, wheat, wheat physiological maturity. Uh, and, and then, and we we installed we installed seed trap around them uh, to capture seeds and to assess uh, seed shattering phenology over time. So the shattered seeds were collected uh, uh, from from seed traps, and uh, the seed shattering phenology was obs observed for uh, twenty eight days of uh, uh, wheat physiological maturity. Uh, so these are our results. Uh, so we observed that uh, so in in these two. In, Two graphs represents uh, different uh, same crop, but in different seasons. So, and, and on, on left we have spring wheat, and on on right we have win, uh, winter wheat. Uh, and the x-axis uh, represents days after wheat maturity, and y-axis represents seed retention percentage. Uh, in spring wheat, we had wild oat. That's that's only uh, only species we had in spring wheat, and in winter wheat we had two species. Species, uh, namely feral rye and cheatgrass. So we can clearly see that uh, we had uh, more than 90% seed retention at, 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 at the time of wheat physiological maturity, but it was drastically declined and it was nearly about 40% 40, 40 at, at, 
uh, 20, 28 days after uh, wheat, physio wheat physiological maturity. Similarly, in winter wheat, we had more than 90% uh, uh, wheat seed retention at the time of physiological maturity and then uh, for, for feral rye. And we had uh, more than 75% of wheat seed retention uh, for cheat grass uh, at the time of physiological maturity. And uh, cheat grass showed kind of similar pattern uh, uh, as compared to wild oat and it, uh, the seed retention was dr drastically, drastically declined up to uh, uh, up to less than 40 percent. So, uh, uh, so the, the take home message is uh, higher seed retention at, 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 at crop physiological, physiological maturity uh, for all three species uh, makes make them good candidate for harvest wheat seed control. Uh, the only thing is the time timely harvest is crucial to capture most of the seeds because uh, uh, like if you want to capture 90% of seed of wild oat and uh, uh, if you want to and feral rye, we need to, we need to uh, start harvesting as soon as our crop matures uh, to capture most of the seeds. And for cheat grass as well, if you want to capture more than 75% of seeds, we can, uh, uh, we will have to start, uh, farmers will have to start uh, harvesting as soon as uh, wheat matures. Uh, and this is uh, our future research plan. So what we are going to do in future, uh, we will uh, uh, we will evaluate the seed shattering phenology of other problematic weeds in the associ in the association with different crops like corn, soybean, and winter wheat and uh, spring wheat. So there are uh, several other problematic weeds like uh, annual rye, uh, jointed goat grass in winter wheat, and uh, peak, uh, uh, lamb squatters, kochia in, uh, in, in spring wheat. So we will start uh, evaluating seed shattering phenology next season. And if you get satisfactory results of seed, uh, higher seed retention uh, at the time of uh, physiological maturity, then we'll start evaluating different tactics uh, of harvest wheat seed control uh, for Northern Great Plains. And we are expecting to uh, get good results for uh, seed retention. And if uh, we will be able to do that, it will be an addition for uh, additional tool for our, uh, for organic farmers uh, in future. And that's it. Thank you. Sasha, do you want to ask your question to head? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm just very curious about the those combine modifications. And I'm wondering, uh, are some of those more popular than others and are they being practiced in Montana and uh, no. uh, so yeah so uh, the if you, if you talk about tactics so the narrow window burning the second one is the most adopted one but uh, I don't think that uh, it has been practiced in Montana since it is a uh, relatively novel approach uh, the it was it was most uh, it is most adopted in Australia the narrow windrow burning and second one is chaff lining because uh, narrow windrow burning basically uh, in initially requires a, a lower amount of amount of modification in combine itself uh, so that's that's the reason it is most adopted but uh, if you talk about the effectiveness effectiveness of uh, of of, uh, uh, of all tactics then impact mill is the is the is the most effective tactics according to one research uh, it pulverizes uh, wheat seeds, uh, as we can uh, as you can see in this figure. And after that, uh, ninety percent wheat seeds will be destroyed, and they won't be able to germinate after coming out from the combine. Mm. Yep. Very interesting. Cool. Thanks. Yep. So, should I stop sharing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. Um, and if if no one has any questions for Het or if they want to ask in the chat box, that'd be great. Um, so now we'll have Sarah Rogers uh, present and behind her we'll have Sasha. Okay. Can everyone see that? Awesome. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Rogers, and I am a master's student at the University of Montana in the Environmental Studies 
program. Um, and today I'm gonna to be sharing some preliminary findings from my research on organic farmers' perceptions and experiences of pesticide drift here in Montana. Um, I'll be sharing the preliminary research that I've done so far. This is an ongoing project. Um, so if you would like to participate, I'm currently still doing interviews and looking for additional um, par um, participants. Um, so the guiding research question for this research, for this, oops, sorry, for this research um, is what are organic producers' perceptions of inadvertent synthetic pesticide contamination in Montana? And then other guiding questions that I've been using um, to push this research along are to what extent is synthetic pesticide drift a problem among Montana organic producers? What actions are organic producers taking to mitigate risk from inadvertent contamination? And then what policy, policy regulatory outreach and research needs um, do these producers suggest? Um, so this research kind of comes out of um, a study that's happening at Washington State University and the um, Organic Trade Association, which is a national survey for organic farmers to learn more about um, their experiences with pesticide drift. Um, and then of course, uh, large instances of pesticide drift in the Midwest and here in Montana um, have kind of led me to realize that more research needs to be done here in our state talking directly with organic farmers. A survey is a great way to get um, a large amount of data and kind of understand broadly how people are feeling, but these in-depth in -depth interviews have allowed me to really hear the firsthand experiences of what organic farmers are going through um, when they suspect that drift has happened, um, when drift is confirmed and then how they're kind of recovering from these events. Um, so I've found um, that drift is, is affecting the individual farmer as well as the whole organic industry. So having these conversations with farmers allows me to see where really those um, different points of effects take place, especially here in our state. So I use um, selective and snowball sampling to find my organic farmers. Um, and then I conducted semi-structured interviews over Zoom um, this past March, and then I'm continuing that now. And then today I'm gonna be sharing um, the data that I found, which is in the form of textual data from um, the interview transcripts that um, I coded from the farmers. So I use key themes when coding, um, and these are just some of the themes that I found um, I can't share all of them today, um, just for sake of time, but the top three that I focused on earlier in this project are the consequences, um, meaning financial or crop loss, and in some cases, certification loss, um, emotional toll. Um, a lot of farmers talked about how their livelihoods have been damaged or changed, um, and that they've really had to rethink how they're farming, um, where they currently live. And then lots of my conversations kind of finished with farmers being concerned about the chemical company's power, um, and how that's affecting organic farming. And then of course, thinking about the lasting impacts of chemicals such as glyphosate in the environment and if that's leading to further drift events um, on their farms. So just to share some of um, my data, which are these quotes, um, I'm not gonna read through all of them, but um, farmers talked about their crops being destroyed with no compensation um, and with no one really to blame because they couldn't really fault their neighbor because they didn't have enough evidence um, and the chemical companies don't take responsibility for it. So who was there to help them pay for these losses? Um, and then another participant talked about um, the market for Camus, um, that their uh, crops had two had levels that were unacceptable in other countries and that they lost full markets that way and that their farms are no longer um, able to even grow a crop that they depended on year after year um, for their income. Other farmers discussed how they had to recertify certain parts of their field um, or just take parts of their field out of organic production because the threats were too high. One farmer I spoke to uh, no longer farms because uh, drift and contamination happened so frequently that they can no longer really feel that they're putting an organic product into the market. Um, and then briefly touching on emotional toll, of course, in these communities, um, you're farming next to people who are either conventional farmers or organic farmers, which uh, in small communities, those are your kind of lifelines. And some of my, the organic farmers I spoke with talked about kind of feeling like outsiders after these events so that they created um, risk between friends and neighbors in ways that they hadn't expected. So um, kind of being on the outside of communities after these happen and then 
with the only option for some of these to sue their neighbors um, and having that not be an option for a lot of people, uh, they just kind of have to swallow the, swallow the consequences themselves. Um, and then to finish, some, a lot of farmers talked about glyphosate being in the rain um, and that the fact that it's in the rain is causing more um, contamination events uh, in isolated fields. Um, and that it's prevalent in the environment and that who's really to blame for that besides the chemical companies when the chemical companies have such protection, um, how, do you, how do you really change that? Um, so what policy could change that and what does that look like? Um, and then, as I mentioned um, earlier, this research is still ongoing. So these um, first interviews really provided me with background and understanding of what pesticide contamination organic farmers looks like in Montana and then kind of has led to this research that I'm currently doing of reworking my questions, additional um, background research and look at policy to understand how we got to this part, uh, how we got to this situation. Um, and I've been able to work with a lot of great organic farmers and create really helpful relationships that have continued to help me to this day as I continue this research. Um, and again, I'm, if you'd like to participate or know someone who you think would be a great participant or you have any additional questions, um, please contact me or let me know. And with that, I think I'll stop for time and for questions. I have a question if nobody else does. I feel like I'm <laughs> motor mouth here. Uh, thank you, Sarah. This is depressingly revealing of a difficult problem. Um, I have a question that's kind of a combined comment and question for you and Hannah. Um, all these quotes and other stories that we all know reveal how difficult and awkward and painful it is for people to talk about this stuff. And there's another way of looking at it besides just damage to organic farmers. Um, just a couple of examples. I used to have a bunch of beehives here and there's a whole community of beekeepers who are bemoaning the loss of insects and birds and so forth in this valley. Um, I have a couple of neighbors who have experienced drift from crop duster um, and we have collectively in our neighborhood watched the change from a former neighbor who had about 1800 acres of certified organic beef production has now switched over to a chemical grain producer. And I think there's some broad scale qualitative observations by citizens of changes. And Hannah, the other day, I don't know if Hannah's still here, but you mentioned this fauna photonics tool that's available and that we didn't really have time to discuss it. But I'm just wondering if there are some other community screening tools that might help this dialogue because when it becomes a battle or even just a conversation between known one neighbor and another, it's really hard to quantify stuff. It's really hard to develop a future plan other than quitting farming, as which is what some people have done that I know. Um, I'm wondering if, if there can be any input from Hannah's research in an indirect way. Any comments from anybody? Oh yeah, what Becky was talking about the fauna photonics is a sensor in your field that can monitor insect activity and you can just leave it out and it collects data continuously. And I think that's a great idea, like you said, between neighbors, like if those are installed in different fields, you could easily compare neighbors. You could compare organic to conventional. You would have more data on the effects of spray. Um, What's the order of magnitude cost that you're talking about for something like that? I am trying to, I'll send you the website. Um, it seems like it's still in a trial period with, they're giving away some to some farmers through an application. So I'll try to see if I can get more data on that because that would be really fun. Thanks. <laughs> okay, it looks like Oli has a question for Sarah. Uh, yes, Sarah. I, I don't know if we have talked yet, but I have had three, three uh, pesticide trips in the time I've been farming in Montana, both by airplanes and by ground applications. And, and uh, every time uh, I have just pursued every option I had to, uh, to, uh, to the full extent. And it, it worked, but you have to be on it, of course. But if we haven't talked, I, I, I would love to give my perspective to you to bring on.
that would be really great. We have not had the chance to talk yet, um, but you, I will say you're on top of my list for the next round of interviews. So I'll make sure to reach out. Sounds good. Hey, awesome. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so up next, we have Sasha, followed by Emma and Andrew, and that will be the end of our graduate student presentations. Um, I'd also like to say that earlier in the chat, I included the MOA YouTube link. Um, so please, when you guys get a chance after this event, go to that link and take a look at the full versions of these presentations. Cool. Okay. I'm up. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Sasha Lowen. Uh, I'm one of Bruce's uh, PhD students as well, working with uh, Paul Hegedus and Hannah Duff as my lab mates. Um, so I work uh, with precision agriculture. I work with uh, a methodology called on-farm precision experimentation, where we're trying to um, use precision ag technologies and figure out how they can best be deployed in organic grain systems. Um, so I'll just show a few examples of how we're trying to use uh, precision ag to help organic grain farmers um, and specifically with uh, nitrogen management, but also with weed management. Um, and I really just want to pause for a second and look at this picture that I posted here, because this is one of the fields that we're working with. And this really uh, highlights some of the variability that we see across fields, uh, farmers fields. Uh, you can see these brown patches are our hilltops where, where the crop isn't growing as well. And then these dark green patches are thistle patches where um, thistles are starting to take over the field. So I just love that picture for, for all of that that it shows. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to skip this little intro and just jump right into the precision experimentation methodology that we use. Um, so in this method, we... Um, put out um, varied seeding rates uh, across an entire field to try to learn about that field. So we wanna know uh, how will those varied input rates uh, respond across the field, uh, specifically uh, in terms of uh, yield. And so we deploy these randomized prescriptions across the field, then we collect as much information as we possibly can about that field. And that's really where Paul's talk comes into this. And that's where we're collecting all the data we possibly can. So everything off of the farmer's equipment and anything off of satellite information. And that can all then be compiled into one model where we can really start to uh, come up with an optimized prescription map uh, for whatever that input of choice is. In this case, we're looking at seeding rates of, of cash crops and, uh, and cover crops. And so, yeah, we have a bunch of farmers we're working with across uh, Montana and also back home where I'm from in Manitoba. And let me just show you a quick couple examples. Uh, so this is an 80 acre piece um, in North Central Montana. This was a, um, a pea plow down in 2020 and then was seeded to winter wheat uh, in that fall and harvested this year. And across this field, we put in uh, varied rates of pea green manure seed across that field to try to determine what the optimum seeding rates for that pea would be uh, across the, uh, at any point on the field. So um, yeah, just kind of an overview of what our modeling process looks like. We get as much information as we can, again, as I said, from satellite and other information. Uh, key variables always being topographic variables, especially elevation. This third map here you see is the elevation of the field. So starting a bit higher in the south near the road and then um, going lower as we move north away into those low points uh, in the distance you can see on the map. And so what we what we did was this experiment here in, in panel four. You can see the varied seeding rates across the entire field. So the farmer put in these varied rates of P uh, and then harvest time the following season. So again, plow that, that green manure in, plant winter wheat, harvest the winter wheat. This map here is what we see is the, um, in the, the darker squares are the higher yielding points and the white and, and gray are the lower yielding points. And, um, and you can, and we can, what the goal then is to start to tease apart what are the responses to those, those um, varied rates and how can we come up with an optimized uh, map from that? And I just want to highlight a couple rows here because you can actually see it 
via visual inspection that in that area of, of highest P seeding rate, um, highlighted in red here in the dark purple, uh, you can actually see a, a visual representation in the, in the yield the following season where in that area, there is a reduced yield across that space, showing us that, um, that the, the area with the higher P density the preceding season actually uh, caused a reduction in yield the following season, presumably because of, um, you know, we're going into a drought here, the higher plant densities used up more water uh, than, um, than the areas with lower um, uh, PC density, causing that yield reduction the following season. But those are the kinds of uh, questions that we ask from all this data, and, and, and we want to know what the drivers are, but we also want to be able to simply come up with a new optimized map. And so in the sixth panel here, you see what we would, uh, what the output from our model is in terms of coming up with new optimized um, seeding rates. And so this purple, purple map here shows what the uh, new optimized seeding rate for P would be set out across that field. And you can see uh, it mirroring a lot of the topographic variables where some of those slopes and so on are causing the field to act in different ways in different parts of the field. And so perhaps in this area where the model is finding that a higher plant density could be uh, handled is due to uh, more water accumulation or other factors or different soil types. And we can start to parse that apart using uh, this method of, of precision experimentation. And of course, when we run that through our model, the simulated yield uh, is a, we are able to show that we get a higher simulated yield based on these simulated results. Um, and so I have lots more examples I can talk about. Um, Oli, I know you're here today. I have lots of data for your field as well. And, and I really want to get into that with you in the future. But today, I just wanted to highlight that we did this exact same experiment um, just a few just a few miles away, and on the second field, um, so sorry, on the first field, the optimum average pea seeding rate was around 80 pounds per acre, but on a on a second field, just a few miles away, the optimum seeding rate was 110. And what that really highlights is the variability that we see um, uh, between fields, and really. Um, highlights the need or the, the usefulness of this precision experimentation to start to show uh, what optimum rates might be um, on different fields, uh, even within similar areas and similar weather patterns that see similar weather patterns. Um, okay, I'll start to finish up here. Um, so this is an 80 acre piece in Manitoba where we have, uh, again, varied the, the wheat rate across this field, as uh, seen in, in panel B. Uh, in panel C, now we see uh, the weed, um, sampled weed pressure across that field. So I've actually gone out and sampled across this whole field in random points to, to collect a, a map of what the weed pressure looks like on that field. And based on a, on a new model, we can come up with instead of optimizing for yield or net return, we can actually optimize for minimized weed pressure. And so farmers, of course, organic farmers are struggling with um, managing their weeds. And so this can be one more tactic that they can use to manage their weeds, uh, whereby they can come up with a, an optimized prescription to, um, uh, to use plant densities as a weed competition tool. And so you can see in some parts of the field, the model is suggesting, yeah, plant high densities there to compete with the weeds. And in some parts of the field, it's saying, you know, the weed density isn't having an effect. So you can go with the lower weed um, or the lower seed uh, input. And um, we, com we conducted this experiment a second time in 2021 using a different crop. But I just wanted to highlight how different the weed pattern looks in the second year and how different the optimized um, prescription map looks in the second year, really highlighting that these experiments need to be conducted over many years to start to generate uh, some of the understanding of the variability uh, over both space and time. Um, okay, and then finally, just some future projects. And this definitely relates to some of the things um, Dan and Kara were talking about with thistles. So here is a, is a field where we've been varying seeding rates over time, again, uh, in the same manner that I showed for the first example where we're trying to 
maximize that uh, green manure and the and the cash crop. But we've also been measuring thistle patches across this field to see how those thistle patches interact with the differing seeding rates. And you can see every year the thistle patches in general are expanding each year, growing larger. But we want to know what are the what are the seeding rates and how are they affecting those thistle patches. And so that's not data I have analyzed yet, but that'll be really cool to see coming up. So I just wanted to highlight that we're working on that. Uh, and with that, I will finish up here. Um, and yeah, we're working, you know, we're continuing to work with these farms over time. We want to automate as much of this process as possible. So that really gets to what Paul was talking about and, and make, uh, make software applications that farmers can conduct a lot of this, this work on their own without, uh, without researchers being present. So I will stop there and uh, take any questions now, or if I'm out of time, we can move on to the next presentation. Yeah, if anyone has a um, quick question for Sasha, go for it. Uh, Joseph, I think you might be muted if you're asking something. Can you hear me? There now we can. Go. My apologies for that. Great. Okay, uh, so two. I have two questions. One is so on the first two, first field, the one in North Central Montana where you had the P, the eight acre um, field. You terminated the cover crop um, sometimes in spring, right, or in just be, and then you planted the winter wheat in fall. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think that pea, generally the pea crops grown as green manures by organic farmers are grown for around six weeks to minimize uh, water loss. Yep. Um, yeah. So that so, one, yeah, mm -hmm. go ahead. So uh, my question would be, is that enough time? Uh, do you think all that residue was able to mineralize or to be, you know, broken down and mineralized enough, you know, the needed nitrogen for the for the winter wheat, or you think that some of the residue was still remaining in the soil by the time of harvest. And my final question is, did you find any effect of increase, increased seeding rate on wheat pressure in uh, Manitoba? Because you did weed you are doing uh, increasing the seeding rate of weed of wheat to see yep. that effect on on weeds, right? Yep. Uh, did you see any effect? So that's my sec my second question. Yeah. So uh, to your second question, uh, on those fields with the with the wheat uh, interacting with the seeding or with the weeds, it was um, area specific. So. On parts of the field, we saw an effect of the seeding rate on the weeds, and on parts of the field, we did not. Okay. And so we can get further into that, and I have data on specific weed species that we can get into and so on, but it's definitely a spatially explicit pattern where in some parts there is no effect and in other parts there are. And I have more data to go through to maybe hopefully explain some of the drivers behind that, but, but there's a lot going on there. Um, yeah, and then your first question, would it have all mineralized? I mean, it wouldn't have all been available for the following crop, but um, you know, our hypothesis is that that we would see an effect from that. And based on greenhouse experiments, which obviously are different, we we do we do find an effect from the seeding rate into the nitrogen into the following crop. So we we think there is something there, but no, that, those are great points for sure. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. Um, all right, thank you, Sasha. And we'll get into our last uh, group of grad student presenters before we um, hand it off to Mary Stein, who will introduce her um, undergrad capstone class. Um, so hope everyone can stick around for their presentations. Um, but first we will have Emma Kubinski and Andrew Christensen talk about their project. All right, let me just share my screen. All right, can everyone see that okay? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, all right, we'll, we'll go quick because I know we're close on time. 
Um, but my name is Emma Kabinski, and I will be presenting it today with Andrew Christensen. Um, we are both students in Dr. Fabian Nolan's lab, and we'll be talking a, about a preliminary study we did um, with Dr. Mac Burgess assessing the critical period of weed control in organic carrots. Um, obviously, we know that weeds are an issue in all crops, but in particular, they are a big issue within um, carrots in a study done a uh, while back uh, comparing to compared to 25 other common crop varieties it was found that suffer or carrots suffered the most significant yield loss um, due to this to manage weeds within carrots there's an extremely heavy labor demand um, and this couple coupled with labor shortages in the united states creates an extra challenge for weed management within carrots um, so obviously with this challenge, finding the most efficient time to weed your carrots is very important. Um, so this is again, where the critical period of weed control comes in, which defines the time a crop can persist with weeds without having um, yield loss. So to kind of just elaborate on this quickly a little more, if you have a crop that persists its entire life cycle without any uh, weed pressure, you're probably going to have pretty good yields. But on the other extreme, if you have uh, your crop competing with weeds the entire its entire growth cycle, you're probably going to have pretty poor yields. Um, however, there's a lot of time in between where this could change. Um, perhaps you let weeds um, persist in the beginning of your crop's growth cycle, or perhaps you um, manage them at the very end. Basically, all this time has unknowns about when is the best time to weed your carrots to still have a yield while also maintaining economic returns with the amount of labor it takes. Um, so in the literature, there is very little information on what the um, critical period of weed control is within carrots. There was one st uh, study done back in 2010 but this was only looking at conventional systems with the use of herbicides and it only looked at the beginning of the critical period of weed control. So basically only weeds persisting at the beginning. Um, so to fill this knowledge gap, we um, did a study looking at um, or assessing what the critical period of weed control in carrots is within the Great Plains to equip producers with the knowledge um, to have the best yields, quality, and economic returns within carrots. Um, I'll let Andrew take it from here. Cool. Thanks, Emma. So for our design, we just did a randomized block treatment, and we had three plots that were weed-free up to certain leaf stages, and then three plots that were weedy up to certain leaf stages, and then we had a weed-free all season and uh, weed competition all season. Um, so not, we wanted to look at the effect of human input into the carrots quality, um, because we are part of the environment as well. So our way of kind of tackling this social sustainability was taking stopwatches out there, um, and timing ourselves as we're using our stirrup hose and hand weeding methods to make each of those plots, uh, weed free. So we could have an economic cost benefit analysis when we started taking data. Um, so for the data, we just got tw 20 carrots from each plot, uh, representative samples. And then the data we got was um, the carrot weight below, below ground and the carrot weight above ground. Um, and we wanted to get both to see the resource allocation in the carrots. And this picture in the middle is pretty cool because you can see that's carrot that had weed pressure all year. Um, and just like none of its resources went to its carrot and it was all, um, going above ground to outcompete those weeds. Um, we also got bricks sugar content, which for the Hercules carrots we were growing was right around 8%. And then we created a marketability rating of one to five, just based off of size and shape. So one would be something too small to use for processing and something that is all kinked and swirled. And then a five is nice, big, perfect carrot. Um, so we really like this picture because it's our we don't need statistics picture, but um, it's just one carrot from each plot laid out um, and starting, Emma, you want to drop in? Yeah, so starting on the left, you have the season long weed free 
And then as you get uh, more and more weed competition, you slowly work to that season long weedy carrot. So um, just a preliminary study and we didn't get to define the exact critical period for weed control, um, but just visually you can see it's kind of right in between that leaf stage four um, reverse bell curve. Um, and Emma, I don't know how much we need to go into the graphs here, but essentially all our data was just following that, um, that reverse bell curve where somewhere in the middle, um, it's really obvious that there is a critical period for weed control. And we just need to do more statistical analysis to figure out what that exactly is. But just flipping through all the graphs really slow, you can see that the sugar, the marketability, um, our theoretical profit um, was all following the same trend in the data. Um, where more weed pressure was worse profit, worse weight in carrots. Um, and then the next one should be the labor. Uh, so the labor is there in purple. And then we have the carrot weight in orange. And we didn't see the perfect correlation where more labor equals better carrots or more labor equals more profit. Um, just a preliminary study. So we're not really sure why, but um, I think we we're being really meticulous on our weeding and it's hard to um, model out the work pace of research scientists compared to farm workers. Um, so uh, moving on. So yeah, this product, we did it out at Towns Harvest. It was fun. We had some field days where we educated and then for weed ecology and management class, we used it as a, as a lab to teach the concept of the critical weed free period. Um, and then just lastly, we want to, we're going to do it again this summer on a bunch more farms. So if anyone on this call wants to be a part of this, we're looking for people to be interested. Um, and into the future, we wanna see how this critical period for weed free control or critical period for weed control um, can potentially be correlated with value added products like carrot juice or processing carrots. Um, and then we also wanna evaluate the weed communities more specifically. So yeah, thank you. Great, thanks guys. Any questions for Emma and Andrew? Looks like Joe's got a question. Uh, Joseph, oh, sorry. Nope, sorry. Uh, that I did. I forgot to lower my hand earlier. Okay. Okay. Um, so if there aren't any questions um, right now, feel free to add any into the chat later on. But I think that we will move on to Mary's capstone students. All right. Hi, Dan. Can you hear me? Yep, we hear you. Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. Those were super interesting. Thanks, grad students and Andrew. <laughs> um, um, I am here today to introduce the seven undergraduate students who are part of the Sustainable Food and Bioenergy Systems um, capstone class. They're all seniors in this interdisciplinary undergraduate degree program. And they all um, completed internships this past summer as part of their degree requirements. And from that, those internships, they developed poster presentations that they were super excited to share at the MOA meeting in person while networking with all of you wonderful people. But here we are, we're networking online and hey, that's fine. It's okay, it's not great, but it's okay. <laughs> um, so I, the, what the students have done, as you know, is that they've recorded five minute um, summaries of their poster presentations. And I believe what we're gonna do, unless I hear an uproar from the undergraduates is that we're just gonna play their uh, five minute videos. And um, I think what we'll do, maybe we'll take a break in the middle and have a Q and A after three and then we'll do a Q&A after the last four. Does that sound good, Dan and Kara? Okay. So I have them on my screen. Can I share my screen, you guys? Is that possible? Um, you, sh you might be able to, you should be. You should be able to, Mary. Okay. All right, can you guys? Hey, uh, we'll start with Gracelyn Abel's video. So you guys let me know if you can see my screen. Yes. Does it all look good? I'll move this down low and we'll start with this one. Here we go.
Hello, my name is Grace Enable. I'm a student at Montana State University in the Sustainable Food and Bioenergy Systems program. Over the course of last summer, I developed a series of short form videos to bridge the gap between limited resource beginner gardeners and location appropriate knowledge for the Gallatin Valley. The pandemic inspired many to take to the soil for the first time, perhaps as an excuse to go outside. For others, it was the foreboding empty shelves at the supermarket. Whatever the reason, there was a noticeable uptick in new gardeners. It was my goal to figure out a way to communicate gardening know-how to newbies, especially those facing food insecurity and financial strain. Through partnering with the Gallatin Valley Food Bank, Bozeman's Human Resource Development Council, and Towns Harvest Garden. I researched, planned, and filmed an assortment of topics. These topics range from seed buying, bed preparation, weed control, season extension, and food preservation. It was important that each video could be watched independently and that everything was easy to understand. I made sure to be mindful that many gardeners have limited space to work with, and so I catered content towards container gardens and small spaces. It was important that the medium used to disperse this knowledge was one that was accessible to those most in need. A lot of resource poor individuals are also time limited. That is why I chose to make short form videos to be posted on social media. These videos are one to three minutes in length, maintaining the attention of the viewer, respecting their time, keeping the information in easy to digest bite-sized pieces. This is no easy feat, as it can be very difficult to condense information to fit within the parameters of short form video. My time spent at Towns Harvest Garden, as well as my education, gave me the foundation needed to undertake this project. However, true success could not be achieved without the thoughtful advice from the Gallatin Valley Food Bank Director, Jill Holder, my program director, Mary Stein, and the town's director and professor, Mac Burgess. Their knowledge and expertise was paramount to making this series what it is. I believe these videos will help limited resource audience find gardening more accessible and the information provided useful. Thank you so much for your time. All right. Thank you, Gracelyn. Um, I'm going to move now to Dylan Halverson, who did his internship over at Homestead, Homestead Organics Farm uh, in the Bitterroot. Hello, my name is Dylan Halverson. I'm a senior at Montana State University studying sustainable food and bioenergy systems. Last summer, I did my internship at a farm in Hamilton, Montana called Homestead Organics. My poster presentation will be shining a light on how they were a great example of social, ecological, and economic sustainability. I want to begin by giving an overview of some key terms and concepts that will be embedded into this presentation and also topics I would love for questions to be asked about. The science and or practice of agroecology permaculture versus monoculture farming systems and why one may be considered more resilient than the other. What does regenerative agriculture mean? The importance of soil building, ways to promote and protect biodiversity on farms, identifying ecosystem services, mixed farming or wild farming, agroforestry, cover cropping and intercropping, food sovereignty, what is a gift economy and how is it based on reciprocity versus extractive methods of interacting with resources? So to begin, I just want to talk about sustainability at large. So sustainability can mean a lot of different things to different people, but for the sake of this presentation, we'll broadly define it as meeting the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So moving into the social aspect of Homestead Organics, Homestead Organics Farm initially started out as a farm that was mostly transactional, selling their produce through their CSA farm stand and attending farmers markets. Eventually it transformed to be a lot more experiential with the creation of a nonprofit organization called Cultivating Connections, 
Laura Garber, who is the owner of this farmer, started this educational program to give high schoolers the opportunity to spend time outside learning the basics of farming while also getting paid and developing relationships with their peers. This equips the youth with lifelong skills while also promoting a healthy lifestyle. Laura also hosts workshops on the farm that are open to the public. This provides additional opportunities to share knowledge with all age groups in the community. Food is such an important part of life that we can foster community around, and it makes a big difference when it is nutritious and you have a direct connection to where it came from. Moving into ecological sustainability, a system may be deemed unsustainable if it consumes resources faster than they can be renewed naturally, discharges more waste than natural systems can assimilate without degradation, or if it depends on distant sources for its most basic requirements. It was such a paradigm shift for me to actually wake up every day this summer and have almost all the essentials of life provided in a 14 acre plot of land. Homestead Organics approach to farming includes many principles of agroecology, which aim to mimic the processes of natural systems. They recognize and support the existence of ecosystem services provided by healthy soils, diverse species of plants and animals, and agroforestry. Some crops were grown to act as a sanctuary for pollinators and others were meant to be herbal tonics that serve as medicinal remedies. They had chickens, pigs, goats, geese, turkey, and ducks. Each of these animals had a unique function and role on the farm. When you look at many of our built environments currently, some can be very industrial and not resemble the surrounding ecology that they're nested in. Homestead Organics was an incredible example of what humans can do through stewardship to restore the land to be flourishing with biodiversity while also benefiting the surrounding ecology. Moving into economic sustainability, the word economy can be defined as a large set of interrelated production and consumptive activities that aid in determining how scarce resources are allocated. A gift economy refers to the economic activity characterized by offering services and goods to other members of the community without the expectation of monetary reward. Homestead Organics operated in both of these worlds simultaneously. Because they have such a diverse operation, it really opened up the opportunity for multiple revenue streams. These included value-added agriculture, glamping venues, catering service, farm tours, and a Patreon account. Laura would also host what she called May Day Garden Giveaways, where she would do all the technical work of seeding and growing plants to the point where they were ready to be transplanted into a garden and give them away to the community so they could start their own garden at home without going through all the troubles that come with being a beginner gardener. If you're curious to learn more about the farm, you can scan the QR code at the bottom of the poster. Also, remember to look at the list of key concepts and terms and ask more in-depth questions, as I would love to answer them. I just want to finish this presentation by acknowledging the Cultivating Connections nonprofit program and Laura and Henry, who are the two owners of Homestead Organics Farm. I want to thank Mary Stein for being such a guiding force and providing support as my advisor and professor in the SFBS program. I want to say thank you to Dr. Wanyuan Kuo because it was in her food product development class that I was assigned Laura Garber as my mentor that eventually led me to getting this internship. Last, I want to send my gratitude to a film crew that I met while being at the farm this summer that helped me with a documentary that I'm currently working on for Homestead Organics Farm and for all farms that are truly acting as a form of economic, ecological, and social sustainability. Thank you. Right. Oh, okay. You all can still hear me, correct, Dan and Kara? Yep. Okay, I'm gonna do one more and then we'll go to a short Q&A. This is Braden Lineman who worked with Dr. Bruce Maxwell's lab looking at effects of bison reintroduction on ecosystems and the environmental landscape within the Blackfeet Nation. Oh, wait, that's Dylan, hold on. Technical difficulties, here we go. Oh, just wanna click. Greetings and thank you for watching this online presentation for the 2021 virtual MOA meeting. My name is Brayden Lineman, and I'm an undergraduate student studying agroecology in the Sustainable Food and Bioenergy Systems Program here at MSU. Today, I will be sharing my capstone research project that I worked on with Dr. Bruce Maxwell. 
The project is part of a multifaceted research experience where MSU students and Blackfeet Tribal Community College students work together to study the effects of bison reintroduction on the ecosystem and the environmental landscape. Bison are considered ecosystem engineers due to the way they interact with their natural environment. Bison reintroduction presents an excellent opportunity to learn about large herbivore effects on their native ecosystems. Through studying and monitoring bison interactions with their ecosystems, land managers can gain effective information about how to produce meat sustainably and efficiently by merging food system production and ecological knowledge. One of the ways we are modeling these relationships is through species distribution models or SDMs. SDMs are models that we use environmental information to predict where a species will exist. This is part of the project that I have worked on for the past two years, surveying vegetation communities and creating vegetation SDMs. My goal and outcome from the summer involved creating a field study design, surveying vegetation communities and incorporating that data into species distribution models. In this study, we are using generalized linear modeling to create our SDMs using NDVI data as well as slope, elevation, aspect, and Euclidean distance from roads as environmental predictor variables. Vegetation sampling was conducted on stratified, randomly sampled transects. Each transect was 400 meters long, consisting of consecutive 10 by 10 meter grids that make up singular data frames. Using GIS and GPS technologies, students maintain georeference data that were then used to map spatial and temporal trends. Vegetation and species of interest were determined through site evaluation and consulting with land managers, tribal elders, and community members. We came up with 16 species divided into groups of common or rare native species, invasive or toxic species, and bison forage species. With remotely sensed data, most of our environmental predictors can just be downloaded from open source online data repositories. I obtained those digital elevation model derived sources, such as slope, elevation, and aspect, as well as derived NDVI from Google Earth Engine or USGS online databases. I then used CRAN R Studio software to plug the data into a generalized linear model and created an STM for each of our species of interest. Here we see two of those SDMs. On the left, bridged sagewort, which is Artemisia frigida, and on the right, sink foil shrub, which is Potentilla fruticosa. Below them, you will see their summary statistics in a table. These tables show their p-values, which signifies the significance of the relationship between each of the variables and the predicted outcome, aka vegetation distribution. Here we see the other two SDMs included in this poster, below which are, again, their summary statistics within the table. Each of those summary statistics shows an asterisk next to the p-value. However, many of those asterisks indicates how significant the result. One meaning somewhat significant and three meaning highly significant. Several models, like the one for Artemisia frigida, for example, we see very high covariate coefficients with highly significant relationships to species distribution. This indicates that our model accurately reflects what's driving that species distribution. There are many sources of error in some of these, however, such as the NDVI data layer causing the roadways to appear ideal habitat. From this summer, Extreme drought and heat cause many abnormalities in vegetation physiology, making the detection of certain species virtually impossible. And due to wildfire conditions, we were unable to reach one of our pastures as it required extensive off-road vehicle travel. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my presentation. 
take care and enjoy my classmates' presentations. Okay, if we want to, uh, I'll stop sharing for a moment. Do we wanna open up any questions for either Gracelyn Abel about her short form video poster, Dylan Halverson about his overview of Homestead Organic Farms or Braden Lineman on the effects of bison reintroduction on ecosystem and environmental landscapes in the Blackfeet Nation. Hey, Grace Lynn, are you going to follow up with another set of videos for this coming season? Hi, Oli. Um, my videos are going to be published starting in January to follow the season so that my hope is to time it right around when gardeners are planning to buy seed, figure out what they're growing, and follow them through the season in a timely kind of live sort of fashion just to make sure that the information is there when they need it and not like months prior when they're gonna forget about it, you know? I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't have a question, I guess just an observation. Um, you guys are doing a great job um, and especially connecting um, digitally. Um, it's such a contrast to the work of Dylan at Lauren Henry's where it's all about, uh, you know, interpersonal, in-person human relationships. So, um, you know, I guess that's a challenge that we uh, just are needing to face now. Maybe it's, uh, so it looks like you're getting a lot of tools from MSU and that's great. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Jamie. All right, anyone else? I think uh, without, if Dan or Kara see anybody, just let me know. All right, hearing no more, we're gonna keep proceeding to the remaining four videos. Desktop, uh, let's see if I can figure out how, oh, I know what I need to minimize, hold on. I'll go over here. Is my screen being shared yet, you guys? I need some eyes. Not yet, Not, yet. Not yet. Okay, thank you. Share. Okay, now we're going to go to, okay, we're going to do Anna McKees. Anna has hers in a Prezi format, so we're hoping this works. Anna's is a unique poster presentation that, that she decided to tell a personal food story or her personal food journey uh, through the lens of her internship at Black Dog Farm, which is a pasture raised pork and chicken operation in Livingston. So let's hope this works. All right, you guys see it? I think we're in luck. Does everybody see the Prezi page? Yes. Yep. Okay, here we go. Hello, my name is Anna McKee and I am a bachelor's degree candidate for the Sustainable Food and Bioenergy Systems Program at Montana State University. I would like to share with you all my personal food journey, the ongoing journey I've taken to reconnect with the source of my food. I grew up on a small family farm in Washington, so the foundation of where my food came from was set in place at an early age. I never wondered where the canned vegetables I ate for dinner came from, or where the bacon I had for breakfast originated. I knew very well that I helped pick those vegetables that we later canned. I probably named the pig who gifted us the bacon on my plate. My family prioritized growing nearly all our own food. And we had the privilege of living on land that provided for us. As I neared high school, there were some changes happening in my life and I ended up moving from my farm to the suburbs of Seattle. The realization didn't set in instantly, but I slowly realized that there was a growing disconnect between my diet and knowing where my food came from. And I didn't just realize this in my own life, but in the lives of those around me as well. I couldn't see a single farm without driving out of town an hour. So why was I surprised to find that I had no idea where most of the food I bought in the nearby grocery store came from? The truth is, this is the reality of most people's diets. Many of us shop at grocery stores where food items are wrapped in plastic and we buy whatever is most convenient. 
When I decided to work towards a degree in sustainable food, I was able to begin reconnecting my childhood, living on a farm to how I wanted to make a difference in my future. Last summer, I had the opportunity and privilege to intern at Black Dog Farm in Livingston with Tim and Kira Jaras as my mentors. Black Dog Farm pasture raises poultry and pork, and I quickly learned how important their methods of raising meat animals are for the future of sustainable farming. Black Dog Farm's pasture raised animals live outdoors and are rotated around the farm inside movable fencing, and in doing so, help rejuvenate their pastures after years of disregard. Their belief in pasture raised meat stems from the idea that animals should be raised outdoors so they can express their natural behaviors and produce healthier, higher quality, and more sustainable meat. Black Dog Farm also strongly supports eating local food and supporting other small scale integrated farmers and ranchers. I learned that there's a big difference between pasture raised, organic and cage free, although sometimes they overlap depending on the farm the product is coming from. When consumers enter the store, it is easy to be blinded by these buzzwords and group them into the exact same importance and meaning. Unfortunately, this is not usually the case. Black Dog Farm does not have an organic certification and therefore their products cannot be labeled organic. Despite the labeling, Black Dog Farm feeds their animals a locally grown mix of peas, wheat, barley, and camelina seeds, which are non-GMO, corn, and soy free. Cage-free meat typically does mean uncaged, which is a great first step in humanely raising animals for meat. However, cage-free does not mean the animals have access to the outdoors. Pasture-raised animals are free to walk around in a pasture, foraging for insects and engaging in other types of natural behaviors. Because of the varied food sources the animals have access to in a pasture, the meat these pasture-raised animals produce is more nutritious with more vitamins and less saturated fats. Additionally, when buying pasture-raised meat, consumers are typically supporting these small local farmers that are working hard to make a difference in the future of eating sustainably. I believe that pasture-raised meat will aid in a hopeful future of eating sustainably. Through my own stories and the stories of Black Dog Farm's efforts, I hope to inspire others to take the steps towards rediscovering where our food comes from. The future of agriculture will be determined by the choices we make in our consumption. Moving into the future, I hope the importance of pasture-raised meat and knowing our food, where it started and how it grew becomes more relevant and important. Micro farms are becoming more prominent, but face threat of large scale monoculture farms that are already a driving force in our current food system. And for my own goals moving into the future, I hope to one day own a small scale integrated farming system that stands for protecting our local ecosystems, strengthening our sense of community, aiding in the health of my neighbors and bridging the gap between consumers and the source of their food. Most importantly, I hope it to inspire others to get to know the plants, animals and farmers that make our meals possible. Thank you. Okay. All right, let's see, how do I get back? My students, I'm sure are laughing right now, watching me struggle with technology. Here we go. All right, we are gonna move on to Grace Nichols, who interned at the Western Ag Research Center in Corvallis, um, examining value-added markets for cold hardy fruits. Hello everyone and welcome to my presentation on cold hardy fruit production in Montana. Today I'd like to talk about an opportunity for market expansion with value added products. My name is Grace Nichols and I'm from the Montana State University in the Sustainable Food and Bioenergy Systems Program. First, let's define value added. Value added means enhancing a product in a way that makes it more profitable. Over the summer, I worked at the Western Agricultural Research Center in Corvallis, Montana, to learn about small dark fruit grown around the state. These fruits include Haskats, Saskatoons, Black and Red Currants, Dwarf Sour Cherries, Aronia, and Elderberries, all which grow well in our cool short summers. The Research Center conducts experiments on cultivation and market research on these berries. More farmers across the state are beginning to cultivate these fruits, diversifying their operations and bringing in different streams of revenue. 
based off customer surveys conducted by the Research Center, Haskaps, Dwarf Sour Cherries, and Saskatoons all have a high level of customer acceptance in fresh eating. About cold hardy fruit production in Montana. Haskaps, Saskatoons, elderberries, and both current species are currently being successfully grown around the state. Haskaps are the most popular, appearing on farms in Helena, the Bitterroot Valley, and the Gallatin Valley. These berries can be found around the state at local farmers markets, going between $8 and $13 per pound. Labor research studies conducted have concluded that hand and mechanical harvesting methods both result in high profit returns. Based off customer acceptance surveys, customers' willingness to pay for a six ounce container of fresh fruit is between $2.50 and $4.70. Existing in potential markets for value added fruit products. Integrating cold hardy fruits into community supported agriculture shares provides a value added opportunity for local farmers. Wines made from Haskaps have become more popular with processing values of the berries going for, thir for three to $8 per pound wholesale. Haskap wines can be found sold all around the state at different wine venues. Both current and dwarf sour cherries are currently being used in local beer and kombucha manufacturing around Montana. Bitterroot area farmers are producing jams and jellies from Haskaps, Currants, Dwarf Sour Cherries, and Saskatoons, and are currently being sold around at local farmers markets. Currently, there is already a market for cold hardy fruit value added products. With more consumers becoming familiar with these products, demand will go up, increasing value of these fruits. Thank you for watching my presentation on cold hardy fruit production and opportunities through value added products. All right, two more and then we'll go to Q&A again. Next up we have Anna Pereira who did her internship at the Matanuska Experiment Farm and Extension Center in South Central Alaska, where she used Instagram for uh, conveying uh, messages through their university extension service. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anna Pereira, and I am a senior at Montana State. I will be graduating this spring with a degree in sustainable food and bioenergy systems. Today, experiment oh, of success with the published content. Wait, we're gonna start over again. Sorry, folks. There we go. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anna Pereira and I'm a senior at Montana State. I will be graduating this spring with a degree in sustainable food and bioenergy systems. Today, I have the privilege of sharing with you all the work that I've done alongside the Matsu Extension Office and Experimental Farm in my home of South Central Alaska. So let's dive right in. In the spring of 2021, our borough extension center was experiencing a struggle with community engagement. Their office, formerly bustling with people, getting their canner gauges tested, taking farm walks, and attending food preservation classes was majorly empty, with only employees and student researchers working in their individual spaces. I worked with the office director to brainstorm how we could bridge this newly created gap. In order to reach our local community and the greater community of Alaska, I spent a couple months developing material for a social media resource page. Throughout the summer and into the fall, I piloted this page using the Instagram platform. In photo, video, and written content, I produced educational and outreach materials covering topics from forage gathering to garden basics. Ultimately, this page has become a space for hundreds of regular followers, as well as thousands of interacting accounts who have the opportunity to engage with extension materials and with each other. So here's a screenshot of the Instagram page, as well as a QR code that you may scan to take you directly to the site. The main elements are visible, a logo, short description with a link, highlights, these are like folders for content of similar topics, and of course the main attraction, posts in the form of photos, videos, um, written captions, all down there at the bottom. 
Um, my work was made possible through collaboration with not only the extension team, but as well many community members and businesses. For all the content created, I participated in hands-on learning myself and documented these experiences and processes. In addition to interpersonal communication, I gleaned information from extension publications and academic articles from within our University of Alaska system. An excellent feature of Instagram has been its provision of data and analytics. So I'm able to see a daily breakdown of follower activity and demographics. These trends are also available over large spans of time, um, like months, years. This is helpful for quantitative measurement of success with the published content. Um, it allowed me to adjust when I noticed that some posts were gaining greater interaction than others. Additionally, I was thrilled to see that the majority of followers are in Alaska, as um, shown in the pie chart, um, even beyond the borough in which I was working. And then the out-of-state and foreign followers um, are primarily similar accounts, such as teaching on the general topic of food systems. There is great potential for this form of media to be used in extension services. First and foremost, it promotes public access to education resources. For example, um, Mont guides and main points of certain academic publications, in addition to um, promoting news, upcoming events. Secondly, collaborations with farmers, local producers, university faculty. It's made much easier with the flexibility of Instagram live videos, posts, and what are called takeovers. Um, with the Alaska Home and Harvest page, I was able to write business profiles, and I even hosted a giveaway with a company from the Lower 48 to supply some followers with a greenhouse watering system, which was super cool. Thirdly, but certainly not lastly, this social media form provides an opportunity for expanded employment and internship offerings, and not just for food system or ag related degrees. Marketing, design, communications, all could significantly contribute to extension goals through a project such as this one. In closing, I extend my gratitude to my community on the Denina homeland, its humans, plants, and animals for gifting me their stories, food, and medicine throughout my internship experience. Further, I would like to thank the groups and individuals listed here, a collection of businesses, nonprofits, community members, and extension staff who supported me in creating content and connecting to critical resources. As well, thank you all for listening, and I wish you and yours a healthy and joyous holiday season. Okay. One more video. We have Gavin Usher, who did his internship with the uh, Galton Valley Food Bank um, highlighting, he worked with the summer feeding program, the summer lunch program, and he's highlighting the partnerships that were essential in uh, the success of this program. Hello, my name is Gavin Usher. I'm a candidate for a bachelor's of science degree in sustainable food and bioenergy systems at Montana State University. Uh, this summer, I had the pleasure of being an intern for the summer lunch program in Bozeman, Montana. Um, it's a program of HRDC, work, works with a lot of different area programs. Um, and I was really able to see how many different, like, impactful uh, connections and partnerships uh, really make this program successful. Uh, it serves lunch to any student that is 18 and under. Uh, it's funded through the USDA, again, with a lot of support from HRDC organizing, also kind of along with the food bank in Bozeman. Um, and volunteers are just incredibly crucial. And I'll talk about that more in a second. Uh, but we're able to serve at eight different sites around the Gallatin, around Bozeman area. And they're very centrally located to serve the most amount of students in our area. Uh, we're able to have a vast variety. Our lunches rotate on a two week basis, serving hot lunches every Thursday um, with just a vast variety, not just ham and cheese, but you know, incorporating a lot of local foods in there too, uh, into our 
the impact we serve roughly 350 to 400 meals on average five days a week from june to august in order to do this we really rely and are very grateful to have the support and get 1400 volunteer hours uh, volunteers help us with everything from making food filling the lunch sacks with all different items and also serving lunches out at sites uh, those eight different sites in the Bozeman area. Um, we were able to serve over 31,000 meals this summer, uh, 15,000 being breakfast, 15, another 15,000 being lunches, and just under 1,000 dinners. Uh, very cool that we were able to do that. Uh, and while doing that, we were able to also support our local producers and provide you know, lunches and breakfasts that you know have food that was made in the Gallatin Valley, which is really cool. And doing that, we had two over, yeah, just over 270 pounds of local produce that was from root cellar foods, 75 pounds of lentils from timeless seeds, and 276 pounds of wheat Montana bread, which is almost 5,000 sandwiches worth of bread. Uh, for a total of 622 pounds of local food. Uh, and we were able to do this with a lot of support from different area agencies and programs. Um, we made all of our food at the Fork and Spoon Kitchen, and that was kind of our home base, uh, but worked with a lot of different programs, uh, supporting them and also them supporting us. Um, very grateful to the Summer Lunch Program for letting me uh, be an intern this summer and love with all the work. There we go. All right. So that's a wrap on the seven capstone student videos. If there's any questions now for, I'm going to stop sharing for uh, Anna with her personal food journey with Black Dog Farm. That's Anna McKee. Then Anna Pereira with the uh, Matanuska experiment. Uh, Extension Center in South Central Alaska, the Instagram, um, using Instagram for, with Extension. Grace Nichols with the Western Ag Research Center looking at cold hardy fruit, and then Gavin Usher with the summer feeding program in the Gallatin Valley. I have a quick question about the um, Instagram project. Um, so that's something that we sort of dabble with a little bit in the Weed Ecology Lab. Um, more so as like a, a side hobby, um, but I'm kind of wondering, Anna, what sort of labor effort do you put into it? I, I guess how many hours a week do you feel like you put into this Instagram page in order to actually get results? You know, it varied throughout the summer, depending on the topic that I was presenting on or that I was covering that week. Um, so I tried to keep it at about two hours per day. Um, and so usually that'd be like about an hour of content. So maybe I'm writing, editing photos, and then an hour of actually doing an activity. Um, but then some days it was like I was going out fishing that day and I was documenting um, what that looked like. And so it was three hours or four hours. Um, or one day I went out and I was harvesting um, from our from the garden I was using at home. Um, and to be honest with you, like footage, like you can weed, um, but then when you try and you know, make an Instagram lesson about weeding or the importance of weeding, you're filming for like three times as long as you're actually weeding to like get the cool like glove shot with the, you know, soil looking just cool. And so, yeah, I would say like 10 hours a week is what I did this summer on average. Um, and then as the school year started, so I started a little bit into the fall and I dropped it down to about five hours a week. Um, and it was mostly written content and like sharing publications. Um, connecting people to like podcasts and, and things to read as we kind of died down from the harvesting and cultivating season and more into like the storage um, and like time for rest and slowing down and maybe some education. And then of course I was starting school as well. Great, awesome, thank you. Yeah. I just wanna say it's pretty amazing what you guys are all doing. I mean, you guys are shaping the future and what you're learning here and, and so I, Thank you for all your presentations. It's, it's truly, truly an honor to see what you guys are doing. Thank you. Thank I you. Couldn't, I couldn't agree more, Oli. They're a pretty fabulous group of students.
Any other comments or questions? Just well done, everyone. And again, I hope we can meet in person soon. Thank you. I hope so too. Thank you all. And thanks for making it happen so the students could present their work. I really appreciate that. Thanks, Mary, for all your work in pulling this together too. And Dan and Kara and every all the students. Dan and Kara. And their yes, exactly. <laughs> and their advisors as well. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yep. Thank you guys for being so flexible. Um, please, if you can, go to that YouTube link and um, take a look at the full presentations. Uh, we all saw the undergrads' presentations, but the graduate students also have different versions of, of what they discussed today. So please take a look. Thanks.